Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to the penultimate day of this current series of the 12 days of Celtic mythology. We've been following the Welsh tale of Kilhoch and Olwen, and we're not done yet. There were some great answers to yesterday's questions about Mabon's seemingly great age, as he's described in the story of the oldest animals. One person reminded us that this description adds to the sense of otherworldliness, both of the story of Mabon himself and the whole tale of Kilhoch and Olwen. Someone else suggested that this might point back to ancestral memories of how the Old North was in the distant past. A third person talked about how they felt like this points to the great wisdom of Mabon. One of the wonderful things about this story is that it's so deep, so expansive, that all of these things may be true at the same time. There's a great deal about Kilhoch and Olwen and about Mabon ap Modrand that I haven't had time to share with you during this series. I'm teaching a class about the Old North, which starts on Saturday. And in February, I'll be teaching a class called Irish Brythonic Connections, where we'll also look at this story from that perspective. I also teach a six-week class dedicated to Mavon, Modron, and Maponos every year, and one about the four branches, and yes, one about animal transformations as well. I think Killoch and Olwen probably comes up in all those classes one way or another, but none of them are about this story in particular, and that's the thing. Celtic mythology is like a huge network. It's not just a book of stories with discrete chapters or one linear narrative. It's more like a huge map with paths running here and there, crossing and recrossing one another. Okay, on to our story. So Kilhoch is a young man trying to obtain a giant's daughter. And lucky Kilhoch, he's King Arthur's younger cousin. Uspidad in the giant has set Kilhoch a long list of difficult and dangerous tasks before he'll let his daughter marry him. Arthur and his men seem to be doing most of the hard work here, and having completed many of the difficult tasks, they're now faced with the prospect of hunting a dangerous, magical boar called a Turtrith. Preparations are being made for the hunt. Now, it was around the same time that the uneasy peace was brokered between Kai and Arthur that the war between Gwynap Neath and Gwither, son of Greidol, erupted. This was over the maiden Kraithalad. Arthur went to the north and settled the treaty between them that we have heard about before. He then obtained the horse Gwynmungthun and the leash, of course, for the use of Mabon at Modron in the coming hunt. Next, Arthur sailed for Brittany, taking Mabon, son of Meht, and Gwari Gwast Eirin with him. There, they obtained the two dogs of Glithfer Leduig. After that, Arthur took his ship to the west of Ireland to look for Aeth, king of Ireland. He then returned to Britain and traveled to the north again, where he captured Caleder Wift. His next task was to hunt the boar Esgithrin, chief boar of Britain. He was accompanied by Mabon, son of Meht, who held the two whelps of Glithfer Ledewig, as well as the mighty Dridwen. Arthur himself joined the hunt with his own dog, Cavill. But it was Cow of Prydain who mounted Arthur's mare in the confusion of men and dogs, and it was Cow of Prydain who also struck the killing blow on this Githrin, cleaving his head in two halves with a hatchet and taking the tusk. It was Arthur's dog, Cavill, who finally killed the boar. Arthur returned to Cornwall. He decided to send Menu to Ireland to see whether the comb, razor, and shears were really between the ears of Turk Trith. After all, it wouldn't have done his reputation much good if he had fought the boar for nothing. Menu went to Ireland in the form of a bird. He saw that Turk Trith had already laid waste to a full third of Ireland. He flew over the boar's lair and saw Turk Truth below him with the treasures between his ears. Menu tried to fly down and snatch them, but instead of snatching the barbering tools, he accidentally pulled a bristle from the head of Turk Truth. The boar flew into a fury and shook himself, causing drops of poison to land on Menu, who was never the same again. Now Arthur started out for Ireland once more, and this time he took the cauldron of Durnach Withel and left him for dead. 
He then traveled around Britain and its islands, gathering heroes and armed men. And then over to France, Brittany and Normandy, he went to gather as many great horses and dogs as could be got. All were mustered for the hunting of Turturith. When Arthur and his army of huntsmen finally arrived in Ireland, the Irish paid tribute to him and asked for protection. Arthur found the lair that many had spoken of, and there was Turk Trith and seven of his young offspring with him. Dogs were set on them, and it was agreed that the Irish would fight them first. But after a hard day's fighting, Turk Trith had laid waste to another fifth of Ireland. The next day, the hosts of Arthur's army attacked the boar, but all they got for the trouble were grievous wounds. On the third day, Arthur himself did battle with that boar. That battle lasted for nine days and nine nights, and still, at the end, he had only managed to kill one of the young pigs. The men asked Arthur about the origin of Turk Trith, and he said he was once a king, and he was turned by God into a swine for his sins. Arthur then sent Gurhir to try to speak with the boar. Like Menu, Gurhir also went as a bird and perched above the lair. In the name of the one who put you into this form, said Gurhir, if any of you can speak, come and speak to Arthur. One of the piglets was more beautiful than the others. Grigan Silver Bristle, he was called, for his bristles seemed to glitter, and this made him stand out from the others, and it was Grigan who replied, By the one who put us into this form, we will not help Arthur, neither by word or deed. Our plight is bad enough without the trouble which Arthur now brings on us. I say to you, said Gurhir, that Arthur only looks to gain the razor, comb and shears that are between the ears of Turchtrith. Beyond that, he means you no harm. But Grigan replied, we will kill Arthur before he will get those from us. And tomorrow morning, we will leave this place and go to Arthur's own country. And we will destroy whatever we can there. Well, Arthur certainly gets around. I make that two trips to North Britain three to France, and three to Ireland. If he was alive today, I'm sure he'd have a private jet and a helicopter. And what about that little piglet, Grigan Silver Bristle, the spokes piglet? I've been waiting all these days to say the phrase spokes piglet. I love it. Spokes piglet. There's something special about him, but you'll have to wait until tomorrow before we unlock the mystery. Right now, I want to go back to the first of Arthur's trips to Brittany. This first part is from today's episode. After that, Arthur went over to Brittany with Mabon, son of Meft, and Gwari Gwaft Eirin to seek the two dogs of Glithrer Ledawig. And Mabon, son of Meft, went with the two dogs of Glithrer Ledawig in his hand, and Dridwen, the whelp of Gryd, son of Eri. You may have noticed Mabon of Meft before. He's mentioned in the poem, Who is the Doorkeeper, which we've looked at a couple of times now. There's this bit. Manuid brought back shattered spears from Trevruid, and Mabon ap Meft, he used to stain the grass with blood, a mighty warrior. Who is Mabon ap Meft? Well, we can't be sure, but I'm pretty sure, based on what Ospedadin says in the Anoithai. Turk Trith will not be hunted until Dridwan, the whelp of Gryd, son of Eri, is obtained. There is no hunter in the world who can handle that dog except Mabon, son of Modron, who was taken from his mother when he was three nights old. Here, Mabon ap Meft clearly has charge of Dridwan, so it seems likely that Mabon ap Meft is another name for Mabon ap Modron. Remember that Ap Modron, son of Modron, refers to Mabon's mother, the goddess Modron. Perhaps Meft is his father. Meft means lightning. Mabon, son of lightning. This might refer to a fairly obscure deity from Gaul called Meldius, or it might be part of a later idea about the conception of Mabon, which is lost to us. Anyway, this is probably Mabon Ap Modron by another name. But the next question is, who is Gwari Gwaft Eirin. If his name seems familiar to you, it's not from the court list or the Anoithai, it's probably because you've read the first branch of the Mabinagi. 
Do you remember the bit where Rhiannon's infant is stolen from her while she's sleeping? The baby mysteriously turns up in another location in the doorway of the house of a man called Ternon. He and his wife decide to raise the boy, so of course the boy will need a name. The name he was given was Guri Goldenhair, for the hair that was on his head was as yellow as gold. Some translators just leave that name untranslated, Guri Gwast Erin. Now, Guri isn't quite the same as Guare. They don't have the same meaning, but it's suspiciously close, and it's likely to be either a scribal error or a mishearing or even an intentional change on the part of some storyteller. My money is on the name pointing to the same figure. Guri is the son of Rhiannon, who goes on to be renamed Prideri when he's finally returned to his parents. As we've seen, they're both stolen from their mothers as infants. Prideri is only missing for a few years rather than long ages, like Mabon, but there are other parallels in their stories. Later in Prideri's life, in a story told in the third branch of the Mabonogi, he finds himself hunting a boar with his friend Manawudin. I'll just remind you one last time of their connection. Manawud brought back shattered spears from Trevirud, and Mavon ap Meth, he used to stain the grass with blood. These two see a shining white boar, surely an otherworldly creature, and pursue it. After the boar they went until they could see a great towering kyre, newly made, in a place where they had never seen either stone or building before. The boar was making for it swiftly with the dogs after it. Once the boar and the dogs had gone into the kyre, they wondered at the sight of a kyre where they had never seen a building before. And from the top of the mound, they watched and listened out for their dogs. However long they were there, they neither heard any dogs nor saw any sign of them. Lord, said Prideri, I am going into that kyre to find out about those dogs. When he got to the kyre, he could not see man, nor beast, nor boar, nor dogs, nor house, nor dwelling inside the kyre. All he could see, approximately in the middle of the courtyard, was a fountain with marble stonework around it. Beside the fountain was a golden bowl. As soon as he had laid hold of the bowl, his hands stuck to it, and his two feet to the slab on which it was standing. The power of speech was taken from him, so he could not utter a single word, and thus he stood. Manawudin waited for him until it was nearly the end of the day. Late in the afternoon, after he was certain that he would get no tidings of Prideri or his dogs, he came back to the court. Don't worry, Manawudin rescues him in the end. So not only does Prideri hunt a boar, but he also becomes a prisoner in a fortress or kyre. There's definitely something going on here. And some people even think that the word Mabonogi, in which Prideri's story is told, means stories of Mabon. I've wondered whether... The myth of Prideri and his mother Hrianon is just the story of Mabon and Modron dressed up in medieval clothes. We'll hear a bit more about Prideri in tomorrow's episode. For now, here's today's question. Mabon ap Meht and Gwari Gwast Eirin appear together as two men accompanying Arthur to Brittany. I've suggested that both these names might point to the same original figure. That doesn't really explain why they're both in this scene appearing as two separate individuals. Why do you think we find them together like this as a pair? The answer might be simple and straightforward, or it might be mystical and complicated. I'm not sure what I think. What do you think? I'm looking forward to reading your answers. I'll see you tomorrow for the boar hunt. Bring your spear. <laughs>